Hi guys, and welcome to Forensic Friday, where I tell you one true crime case that was solved using forensic science, all while doing, that's right, my makeup. If you like videos like these, please make sure you hit that subscribe button. I know some of you have been watching my videos more than once and just haven't hit that button. Hit it. Today's video will be featuring the new Sailor Moon collection from ColourPop. Well, it's not new. It was released a while ago, but they did have a restock. And so I decided to pick it up and I'm so excited to play in this. I also picked up one of their glitterly obsessed body glitters. Picked up two of the ultra blotted lips. Number one, please read the disclaimer. Number two, I am in no way an MUA or professional makeup artist. And number three, enjoy. This all takes place in San Diego, California in 1994. Workers at the San Diego Fibers Corporation was shifting through some trash, some garbage, and like recycles and stuff when they found something. They found a bag in the cardboard boxes. And that bag, when they opened it, had a pair of human hands in it. Ooh, that don't sound like it's gonna be good. At first, police thought that, how true could this be? Like really, they did, police wasn't really buying it, that it was, they thought it was kind of a prank. They decided to go and check it out anyway. They was coming in very, very skeptical that these were a real live pair of human hands and they performed an x-ray on the hands and they found that it was consistent with a man of the age 60 just based off of the fact of how big the hands were the joints told them that this was a person of the age 65 or older because the joints were so damaged it had to be someone a bit older so the right hand had one distinctive feature the thumbnail was missing detectives asked all of the local morgues and hospitals if they had the body of an elderly man that was missing both hands. On the other part of town, there were two women, Mary and Holly, who hadn't seen their father in a really long time and they were kind of getting worried about this because it wasn't really like him to disappear and they hadn't heard from him in a week. So they started to suspect that something was really wrong. When police learned that Don Harden was missing the thumbnail of his right hand, they knew immediately. And the fingerprint analysis confirmed that the hands, in fact, did belong to a 74-year-old retired Navy pilot named Don Harden. When the police searched Don Harden's home, they found evidence that he had been robbed. Television, VCR, microwave was all missing, including Don's pickup truck. The TV guide was open to March 28th. Police believe this was the last day that Don was home alive. Police also found small droplets of blood in the kitchen and it looked like someone had used bleach on the floor to remove all of the blood or evidence. Don was a widower and he had moved to San Diego just a few years earlier to be near his daughters. Now his neighbors describe him, my eyebrows are a joke per usual. Don Harton's neighbors described him as very difficult of a person. According to his family and friends, Harden was always helping out the less fortunate. He would go and uh, he would often hire homeless men to do like odd jobs around his home. He would even sometimes let the homeless men stay in his camper in the backyard. Police were actually able to recover some of Don's personal items. They found his wallet as well as a license, but it was found in a garbage can and they couldn't find anyone to link to the watch and the driver's license. I guess there was no fingerprints or something. That lead was a dead end. They couldn't find anything to link anyone to Don's murder. Investigators had no idea where the rest of Don Harton's body was, but they knew that wherever it was, it wasn't a good it wasn't a good thing. It was, he's missing his hands, that's never good. Investigators went back to Don's home to see what else they could find and they found more blood in the living room carpet that led all the way back to the kitchen and then to the bathrooms. They were checking the bathroom behind the, a hamper. They found some blood stains and a piece of human tissue. They found it inside of like 
the heater ducts. But to find out whether there was blood that had been cleaned up, detectives brought in luminol. Luminol is a chemical that fluoresces when it comes in contact with iron components of blood. Even after it had been removed with water and detergents, they could still tell if there was blood there by using the luminol. Luminol doesn't really like affect the blood itself, it just helps you find it. It doesn't get rid of the blood or compromise the blood in any way. From that, police can find like a possible scenario as to what happened to Dawn. It's not like a solid, like this is what happened, but it's more of just like um, a theory of what happened. They can start to build their theory on what happened. Now it's time to go into the palette. I'm so excited. All these beautiful shades. I think I will do something with the purples. But anyway, back to the story. After forensic scientists sprayed the luminol, the lights are turned off and a camera with high-speed film captures the images. Once they sprayed the luminol, detectives say that it was the largest puddle of blood that they have ever seen in their life. They said that the floor in the kitchen glue like a Christmas tree, like it glowed. And they also found a blood trail leading back to the bathroom. In the bathroom, guess what? There was even more blood. DNA tests revealed that the blood in fact did belong to Don Harton. The amount of blood in the home led the forensic pathologist to believe that there was no way Dawn could have survived this attack. Authorities notified Dawn's daughters. They told them that there was a huge possibility that Dawn was murdered in his home. Allegedly, Dawn was a pretty quiet person. He was just living his retirement life in his home and he wasn't really doing anything or involved anything. They couldn't figure out who would go to such great lengths to conceal the murder. The lengths that this person took to conceal all the evidence is crazy. Now the day before Don went missing, neighbors say they saw him with one of the homeless men that he would allow to stay in his camper in the backyard. His name is Dale Whitner and he was a 41 year old drifter. History with the police of vagrancy and intoxication, but he didn't have a past history of violence like that. So it, it didn't really make sense. Oh girl, you didn't done something with that. Police started to look into Dale Whitmer and he claimed that he had no idea of the whereabouts of Don. He did, however, say that Don loaned him his pickup truck and that was the last day that he saw Don. He and he just used it to go back and forth to work. He didn't really do anything else. He told the police that he had worked with Don on and off for years. Dell claimed that he loved Don almost like a father, like, but police were about to find out that whatever Dale was saying was not true. Neighbors said that Dale would often confide to them about Don, saying that they, he couldn't stand the old man, that the guy was getting on his nerves. In his words, he was tired of the old man poking at him. He also complained saying that he would belittle him and call him all kinds of names all the time and he just couldn't take it anymore. When police brought Dale into interrogation, they showed him a picture of the severed hands. Now get this, Dale actually identifies the severed hands as Dawn. So police ask him like, how would you how would you know that how would you know that those are don's hands and he said that he had grown accustomed to seeing them that is how he could recognize them so you didn't get along the way that you want us to think you got along boy when police asked dale to take a lie detector test he refused but little did he know his fingerprints were found in Don's home. But since he did odd jobs around the house for Don all the time, this wouldn't be unusual that his fingerprints would be there. According to police, Dale seemed to be very nonchalant about the entire thing. When they asked him questions, he had an answer for every single question, and he didn't seem to be bothered by the questions. Dale told police that he had no idea where Don was, that Don just asked him to do a couple things around the house for him and he hadn't seen him since. With no significant leads, Don's case went unsolved for over a year. It was until police received an anonymous letter that contained all the gruesome details of Don Harden's murder. Police, after reading the letter, instantly knew that 
this had to be their guy because he knew things about the crime and the crime scene that details about the way Don died that no one else outside of the other police officers investigators would know so they knew right then and there that something was up if he hadn't done it then he knew who did and he had all of the details as you can imagine police got super excited about this finally a break in the case in the letter the anonymous writer writes that a guy named Bob his friend Bob knew who the killer was and in fact that the police had already identified him as Dale Whitmer according to that letter Dale really, really hated Don at this point. The letter also stated that Dale was a heroin addict and that he lived behind Mr. Harton's home for about a year before the murders. It also said that he dismembered Don's body in the bathtub before putting it into a bunch of different plastic bags. He buried these bags all around the country and in Mexico. How Don was killed in the bathtub, this was a piece of information that had not been released to the public yet. So this wasn't someone just writing a note or writing a letter based off of the things they saw in the media because that information hadn't been released at all yet. Only the investigators on the case knew that piece of information and, and the killer, pretty much. Whoever wrote the letter say that they told Bob to contact the authorities directly but Bob refused because he was afraid of Dale. He thought that Dale would know the source immediately if he got caught and he might try to silence him or hurt him in some way. It became clear to the detectives that whoever it was that wrote the letter wanted to help but did not want to get involved. He actually wrote at the end of the letter, good luck detectives, thanks. We'd have better luck if, we, if you would step in and. Police sent the letter to the San Diego Forensic Scientist Lab. The first thing that the analysts did was try to find a, a postmark to tell where the letter came from. Police found that the letter was not mailed using stamps, but it had gone through a postal meter. The writer of the letter used whiteout to conceal the number so that police would not know the origins of the letter. Using what is known as a video spectral comparison, various light sources and filter combinations can often reveal what is hidden underneath ink and marker. Detectives tried this new technique and the first two times they tried it, it was unsuccessful. Operator of the comparator, Hugh Kerfman, cut the envelope in half and tried looking through the opposite end of the envelope to see if he could find the numbers. He then used a blue-green light to penetrate the white ink and it worked. The initials PB on the envelope identified the manufacturer. Pitney and Bowes. The serial number revealed the state, city, and street of the meter and the office address of the postal meter. It was located at Davis Capital Management in La Mesa, California. The owner of this company was Mark Davis. He was also a bishop in the Mormon church. When confronted by police, Davis admitted that he was the one who wrote the anonymous letter. Now the source of his information, he said, was a member of the church. But Davis refused to identify the source of his information any further, reciting his religious privileges that exist between the clergy and the church member. Boy, we should just tell the damn truth. What about the fact that somebody got cut up into little pieces and disposed of? What about that? Can you take that to God? Can you take that to the church? You would rather hide it? Let me stop. <laughs> So cops took Davis to court. The judge did not buy it and not rule in Davis's favor. Mark Davis had no choice but to comply with the court's judgment. And he identified the source of the information as Bob, and get this, was Dell Winter's own daughter, Andrea. It's getting sick up in here. It's getting sick. Dell Whitmer was arrested and charged with murder. September 15th, 1997, Dell Whitmer went on trial for the murder of Don Harden. He pleaded not guilty. Little did he know, cops had a star witness that they were about to introduce. Andrea, when she got on the stand, obviously this was really hard for her because on one hand she has her father who she loves and feels like she has loyalty to, but on the other hand she has her religious beliefs. So she was in a very difficult position 
But despite that, she still got up on the stand and told the entire truth. She corroborated everything that Mark had said in the letter. Prosecutors believe that on March 28, 1994, they believe that Dale Whitmer walked inside of Don Harden's kitchen and killed him. The motive they claim was robbery and revenge for the past abusive relationship. Well, the luminol revealed that um, the body was bleeding really, really badly in the kitchen area, and then it seems as though it was moved to the bathroom. So they believe that that is when uh, he moved on to the bathroom to dismember him. Now I'm gonna go in with one of these ultra blotted lips in the shade Usagi. The hands were the only part of Don Harden's body that was ever recovered. Don Harden's two daughters read their letters at the sentencing. Thanks to forensic science and some good police work, Dell Whitman was found guilty of second degree murder. Please let me know in the comments down below what you thought about this case and my makeup look. If you like videos like these, check out my last video. I will leave it linked on the screen right here. I'll see you guys next week with another Forensic Friday episode. Bye.